First came the horrific images flashed around the world within minutes on social media. Then the utter astonishment of people faced with the sheer extent of the damage. A capital city disfigured, in parts almost unrecognisable. Then, finally, the anger of the entire country, faced with the reality of a catastrophe which could so easily have been avoided. On August the 4th, 2020, the huge explosion in the port of Beirut that left more than 200 dead and 6,000 injured. At the heart of the disaster, 2,700 tonnes of ammonium nitrate, a compound that's used as a fertiliser but is also a very powerful explosive agent. It had been stored there with no precautions for over six years. It wasn't long before the tragedy became a symbol for the terrible political, social and economic crisis under which Lebanon has been sinking for years. Anger mounted, Lebanese demanding change. And they weren't the only ones. Two days after the disaster, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, travel to Beirut, bringing a message of solidarity and fraternity, but also proposing deep reform. I am here today and I will be putting forward a new political pact this afternoon. And if they don't know how to honour it, I will be here to accept responsibility with you. But a year later, and the proposed renewal of Lebanon's political class has failed to materialise. The country's leaders still unable to agree on a new government. The official investigation into the explosion not even concluded. And still, Lebanon sinks deeper and deeper. Inflation, unemployment, a food and fuel shortage. Half of the people of Lebanon now living below the poverty line. Well, for France 24, Cyril Payan and Bilal Tarabé revisit Beirut, a battered city which remains unable to heal its wounds. We're going to storm the minister's house. We have to put an end to impunity. We're not scared of anyone anymore. We're going to go all the way. We're going to go into their houses and we're going to throw them in jail. Just look at how they treat us, the families of the victims, but we'll crush them. We'll throw coffins at this bastard's house so he can sense death and know that both he and his family will die, that it will be his turn just as it was ours last August. Today, for the first time, I have settled back down in the place where I usually work, here on the terrace, exactly where I was sitting a few seconds before the explosion nine days ago, when I had just finished what has become chapter 50 of this book and jotted down the first few words of the next chapter. I had not come back to this table when I started writing again, not because of any kind of superstition, but because it has been very hot. 
except that today I need to tie up the broken thread of time again. This blood, my father's blood. This blood, it's my father's blood. This, for this I need, for this blood, I need justice. For this blood you see before, I need justice and I will fight for justice. I miss his, I miss him, I miss when he sat here, I miss when, when we go together, when we go, I miss every second with him. For this, I'm not afraid, and nothing will stop me, me and all the families. Nothing will stop us. After what happened with us, I don't want from war anything, just justice in this case. Because if we have the justice in this case, Lebanon will change. Lebanon will be under law. I spend my day running from one bank to the other, converting dollars into pounds at the official exchange rate and comparing that to the bank's rates, to the changes, then to the black market rate, doing calculations, planning my expenses, half in checks and half in cash, before getting completely muddled and giving up on the whole thing. My wife said that if the entire population could put to better use just a fraction of the energy that it now spends struggling out of the trap set by our broke government and failing banks, then the country could be back on its feet within 48 hours. So here we have a pharmacy that's on strike, and just in front there's a line of cars waiting to fill up at the petrol station 500 metres away. That's the main sign that things have gone wrong, no petrol, people queuing and pharmacies on strike. That tells you everything. At the time when it happened, nobody could have imagined that it would last a whole year, because we said to ourselves that it was really the final straw, that it would change everything. But it didn't change anything. And so afterwards we said, at the end of the day, why would it change anything or get rid of anyone? These people are self-sufficient. They live in a kind of fortress that they protect by insulting the people, paradoxically. They hold us at their mercy while staying in power in their stronghold. And nothing will force them from there, except an extremely violent movement that will take everything with it, all of us included. That's the former railway station, right? Yes, that's the old train station. And then they made a depot for the public service buses. But there are no buses and no public service, so there's nothing here anymore. That's also part of the problem. The railway company still exists and for the past 40 years has been paying salaries with a director and a manager, even if there aren't any trains. That's another sign of cronyism, which obviously generates wasteful expenditures and is linked to corruption. All of these neighbourhoods that were destroyed were where artists, designers, fashion designers and architects had their studios. And this area, which has disappeared, was actually managing to survive during the crisis. It was a kind of creative vitality. And the explosion brought an end to all of that in five seconds, as if it was centred on the very heart of everything that was managing to survive. And bang, in one go, it was all over. Beirut is simply a city that doesn't want to die. For over 30 years we've been through trauma after trauma. They're all still here, one on top of the other, and we live on top of it all. We've resolved nothing, we've just turned away. And when we turn away, we don't learn to be resilient. Quite the opposite, in fact. That's not good, and that's why the word resilience is misused. Moreover, it symbolises the fact that we expect ourselves to be able to continually tolerate things. But we can't tolerate things anymore. I know what I'm crying about. 
I've just understood that this son's mourning, the heartache he experiences again every day from having seen his mother perish, is another loss that I've been experiencing myself for a few months now. A loss I didn't want to face, that I still find hard to admit to, but which is real and pressing and overwhelming. I'm finding it hard to say, to write. But it's about this country, which is in physical decline too, in its death throes in fact. It's about the loss of everything we did, the splendor of our former lives, everything we dreamed of, and all the other potential deaths to come. This is a shop that sells fruit and vegetables. The prices are outrageous. The almonds are 12,000 pounds a kilo. I don't really buy meat anymore. It's 120,000 pounds a kilo. It was only 20,000 not too long ago. Half a kilo and another half a kilo. It was much less expensive during the war. Everything was less expensive. Today, when we fall asleep, a dollar is worth 15,000 pounds, and when we wake up, it's 18, or even more sometimes. It's terrible, truly terrible. Tell me, how are we meant to live? How can we live? There's no petrol, no electricity, no bread. The only thing that's free is the sunshine. France has been present in Lebanon for a long time, and those who've been around since then can apply for French citizenship. I was born in 1936. If I could become French, I would be extremely grateful. Because we are worried. There are no guarantees for people of my age. I don't work anymore and I have nothing coming in each month to help me live. I found myself on all fours. There was blood and white dust on my hands, and my nose was bleeding. When I got up again, his face was covered in blood and he was shouting and gesticulating at the wrecked house. I heard her moaning, but I was pinned under the window pane. All the furniture in the room was sucked towards the back, and a table flew and smashed into his chest. The waiters rushed in, shouting. Then everything collapsed on top of She's us. She's so thin, the blast broke one of her ribs. She was sitting on the stairs, covered in blood, but I had no idea what to do to help her. They ended up side by side on the ground, but neither of them could get up. He was lifted up A and piece thrown of the window the collapsed TV. and broke his shoulder and tore off his ear. She was found curled up in her armchair. She thought she was dead. The couch flew up into the air and fell on top of her. I walked through the streets like a sleepwalker before I realised that everyone around me was injured. We lost track of her and finally found her at the Prenner's medical centre. They tried to open the car door, but they realised he was already dead. She had to be taken out like a puppet through the broken car window. His lungs burst. Everything collapsed. There was nothing left. They found him dead two hours later. This drawing is all that's left of my dad. They took my father. And all that I have today is this image of him. Throughout our lives, we have done nothing wrong. We looked after our own affairs. The most important thing for him was having the money for our studies. 
so we could live independently and in dignity. I hope he's in paradise. I hope he's in paradise and he see us, he know what what we make for him. He know what when we, we when we fight for him and for all these people. Cyril Pyan and Bilal Tarabe revisiting Beirut for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and uh, the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.